The Arctic is warming twice as fast as anywhere else on Earth. Its seemingly remote location in the north might lead some to believe that what happens in the Arctic stays in the Arctic. But that is not the case. The consequences of this region's transformation are being felt by the entire world, not just the Arctic's four million people. And the most important action that we can take to slow Arctic warming over the long term is to substantially reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases. But it's also important to address black carbon, and that's the soot that's produced by dirty vehicles, oil and gas wells, and wildfires, and is a strong contributor to global warming by itself. But additionally, when this soot settles on the Arctic snow and ice, it increases the amount of heat that is absorbed, which in turn melts the snow and ice faster. Now, as the snow and ice melt, the darker land and water underneath the snow are uncovered and absorb more heat. This accelerates additional melting in the Arctic. In scientific terms, this is a positive feedback loop, and it explains why the Arctic is warming faster than anywhere else on Earth. First, you're going to hear from Assistant to the President on Science, Technology, and Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, Dr. John Holdren. I'd like to welcome Dr. Holdren. Well, thank you very much, Christy. We're just going to elaborate a little bit on the key messages that you already saw in that, uh, in that video. Uh, and, and start by emphasizing why do we focus so much on climate change in the Arctic? And the answer to that question is, first of all, as already has been noted, the climate is changing more rapidly in the Arctic than anywhere else on Earth, with conspicuous impacts of a magnitude that compels recognition of the reality and the urgency of the global climate change challenge as well as the need for immediate assistance to the populations above all the indigenous populations that are being affected up there on what you might call the leading edge of climate change. And the other point, which has again already been noted uh, in the video, is that rapid climate change in the Arctic is creating influences on climate outside the Arctic, notably accelerating the rise of temperature globally and affecting atmospheric circulation patterns in the Northern Hemisphere in consequential ways. In other words, as the title of this session indicates, what is happening in the Arctic is not staying in the Arctic. So I want to summarize very quickly what we know about those changes, both inside and outside the, the Arctic, inside and outside the region. First, inside temperature, sea ice, land ice, the glaciers and ice sheets, permafrost, and wildfires, and then outside, the outside the region effects of the wildfires, of the greenhouse gas emissions from the Arctic, and the circulation patterns. And starting with temperature, it's already been noted that the average surface air temperature in the Arctic is going up twice as fast as the global average, but in some parts of the Arctic, it's three to four times as fast as the global average. One of the consequences of that has been shrinkage of the sea ice, about which uh, Dr. Taylor will say more shortly, but the, the short message is that the area of Arctic sea ice in late summer has recently been about 40% smaller than it was as recently as the late 1970s, and the volume of that sea ice is down by even more. And open water instead of ice means bigger waves and loss of shoreline protection, leading to coastal erosion and damage, even evacuation for coastal settlements, and that, of course, is made worse over the long run by sea level rise. Open water instead of ice also means feeding, breeding, and survival challenges for seals, walruses, whales, polar bears, impacting, of course, subsistence hunting. And more ocean, more open water instead of ice means more absorption of incident sunlight, thus increased heating and accelerated further temperature increase in the Arctic. Turning to land ice, most mountain and coastal glaciers across the Arctic are shrinking. That increases river discharge and turbidity. That in turn affects erosion and potentially fisheries in the ocean as well as in rivers. Alaska's glaciers alone are losing 50 to 75 billion tons of ice annually. The Greenland ice sheet is experiencing extensive surface melting in summer, as well as acceleration of the flow of major coastal glaciers to the sea. 
water on the surface of the ice increases absorption of sunlight and thus leads to even more melting. The total loss of ice from Greenland has been averaging 250 to 350 billion tons annually, which is up four times in the last two decades. Thawing permafrost, a high proportion of land in the Arctic and the subarctic is in the permafrost region. For the state of Alaska, the proportion is 80% of the land is in permafrost. And as soil temperature rises along with air temperature, the upper layers of permafrost in the warmer region start to thaw. This is happening over much of the permafrost region. The impacts of thawing permafrost include land subsidence, threatening buildings, roads, and energy infrastructure, increased vulnerability to coastal erosion and wildfires, and exposure of previously frozen soil carbon to being released as carbon dioxide and methane. Expanding wildfires, higher temperatures, drier landscapes, trees killed by insect infestations, and more lightning all related to climate change mean more, bigger, hotter wildfires. The combined acreage burned in wildfires in 2015 in Siberia, Canada, and Alaska, just by the end of August, was over 31 million acres. In Alaska, the annual number of large wildfires has doubled since the 1980s, and the average annual area burned has quadrupled. Wildfires, of course, destroy valuable timber and habitat. They create massive smoke pollution. They directly add large quantities of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and they expose soil carbon to microbial action, producing even more CO2. And of course, they contribute to the thawing of permafrost. In the Arctic, for the first time, we are seeing not only trees burning, not only forest fires, we are seeing the tundra burning tundra fires for the first time in the Arctic. Turning to the last of the local effects, changing ocean chemistry, in addition to reduced salinity and increased turbidity as a result of increased discharge to the ocean of glacial fresh water, the Arctic Ocean, like the rest of the global ocean, is becoming more acidic. And acidification in the ocean is intensified in the Arctic by the combination of low temperature and low salinity that prevails there. The effects of those changes include impacts of acidification on marine organisms that make their shells or skeletons out of calcium carbonate. The interaction of salinity changes with changes in temperature affect ocean circulation. And the impacts of all of that together on marine fisheries. So let me turn for just a moment to the impact of climate change in the Arctic, beyond the Arctic. Those wider impacts include, surprisingly, Impacts on human health as well as visibility, sunlight reaching the ground, and atmospheric heating from the long-distance transport of smoke from the Arctic wildfires. That smoke transport reaches outside the Arctic and has big effects there. The regional changes outside the Arctic include changes in the northern hemisphere circulation patterns. That was suggested also in the video. Blocking highs, slowdown and waviness in the jet stream, bringing polar vortex phenomena into the mid-latitudes, again, because of faster warming in the Arctic. Globally, of course, we are seeing the acceleration of global sea level rise as glaciers and the Greenland ice sheet lose ice as a result of warming, it goes into the ocean, again as noted in the video, and we are seeing increased release of carbon dioxide and methane from microbial action on organic carbon that previously was frozen in permafrost in addition to methane from thawing methane hydrates in soils and sediments. This has the potential to accelerate warming all across the world. And with that, I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Patrick Taylor, who will have some very exciting graphical information to share with you. Dr. Taylor. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Christy, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Dr. Holdren, for such laying out so clearly uh, the, an overview of Arctic science, as well as the, the true challenges that we face. No single satellite can potentially measure all of those different puzzle pieces. Uh, NASA has a fleet of Earth observing satellites, more than half of which involve international collaborations, uh, and uh, the remainder of those involve uh, agency collaborations within the U.S. 
One of the iconic images, in my view, of the rapid and unprecedented changes that we're seeing in the Arctic climate system is of the changes in the sea ice. This is a picture that we have from satellites uh, beginning in 1979 uh, through the present day of the changes in the sea ice extent. The white colors here are showing you the actual area of the sea ice coverage in any given year in September of that year. Uh, the yellow line in front is showing you the total area integrated average. What we see in this time frame as we move towards present day in 2014, uh, we've lost on the order of 3 million square kilometers of Arctic sea ice over this time. To put that into perspective, that's the same land area as the second through the eighth ranked European countries in terms of land area. That is Ukraine, France, Spain, Germany, Norway, Sweden, and Finland all combined together. Uh, for a USA example, that is the same area as Alaska, Texas, California, and Montana combined. Now, it's not quite a fair comparison in terms of numbers, since Alaska has three times the, the, square, uh, the square footage of France, so it's, it's a pretty big state. So in the Arctic, we're not only seeing all of this change in sea ice, land ice is melting as well, as Dr. Holdren referred to. Uh, this really unprecedented data series of the land ice mass that we see over Greenland has been uh, enabled through a rarely unique satellite called GRACE. GRACE stands for the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, and it's a collaboration between NASA and the German Space Agency. What we're monitoring here are the changes in the mass of the ice sheets. The blue colors are showing you places where we've gained ice, which are happening a little bit in the interior. But as you can see, the very strong red colors, Greenland is literally thinning and disappearing at its edges. So again, as Dr. Holdren said, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay there. This roughly 320 billion tons of water that is coming off of the Arctic land flows into the ocean every year, and it's influencing sea level rise globally. Uh, this is a data set that began uh, 22 years ago through a collaboration between NASA, NOAA, as well as the French space agency, CNES. It is a high-resolution picture of the changes over the last 22 years of sea level rise. What you see, the areas that are shown in red are showing you places where seas have gone up. The blue areas are showing you places where seas have gone down. So we've seen some very significant regional variability in sea level. Not, sea level doesn't rise, hasn't risen everywhere. Uh, the global sea level rise that we've seen in this 22 years is about 8 centimeters, or, th or order of 3 inches, at a rate of 3 millimeters per year, which you probably have heard before. Well, you notice these regional changes in sea level rise are due to two factors. One, changes in wind circulation, the water being pushed around differently by the winds. And secondly, because of warming of the sea surface temperatures. Warmer sea surface temperatures, the water uh, takes up more space and therefore higher sea levels. What happens in the Arctic definitely does not stay there. And one very uh, <clears throat> critical uh, component of the climate system that I like to refer to as our circulatory system is, the, is one of the key reasons why. These white arrows that are shown here are surface currents, water flowing at the surface. The grayish colors here are showing you water flowing at depth. As the, the, the first image there, the first arrows were showing you the movement of water from in the Gulf Stream from the tropics towards the, uh, towards the North Atlantic. As that water moves towards the north, it becomes saltier and it becomes a little bit colder. That means it sinks in the North Atlantic. That's a very critical component of the, uh, of the thermal haline circulation, which it's called. Uh, again, I like to think of this as our circulatory system. It's a lot like how blood flows through our body. You know, the heart pumps, moving, body, uh, moving the blood through our veins, making sure the oxygen and nutrients are, 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 are making sure they get everywhere and that our entire body is connected. The thermal haline circulation does a similar thing in that it moves water and energy around, making sure that every other climate region on Earth knows every other climate region. As we see, as it zooms out and showing you the thermal haline circulation for the entire globe, you see that these arrows don't just stretch from the tropics to the poles. They actually stretch from pole to pole, connecting every other climate region with every other climate region. In this image, this is an image of the polar jet stream. It's a fast region of moving airs that's above our head. You may have noticed this. This was shown in the, in the video earlier. Uh, it's a fast moving air, uh, about six miles or 10 kilometers above our head. Speeds reach upwards of 100 miles per hour or 160 kilometers per hour. The red colors here are showing you regions of faster moving winds, whereas the blue and green colors are showing you regions of slower moving winds. As Dr. Holdren referred to, the changes in the Arctic are outpacing the changes of the rest of the globe. They're changing about twice as fast. 
those temperature differences mean that the gradient in temperatures between the Arctic and the regions farther south are changing. And that is a critical constraint on how this atmospheric circulation system actually behaves. As we melt the ice back, more of that solar radiation is being absorbed by the ocean, by the darker ocean, accelerating, causing further warming. Uh, I've, I've personally done some research in this area using climate models, and the models are telling us that this feedback isn't just important in recently, it's going to continue to be important and continue the acceleration of the warming in the Arctic for the next century. Dr. Taylor, can you talk a little bit about tipping points? I mean, we, there's a lot of science to unpack here, but where are the points we think that we really tip into a, a different reality? Well, I have, uh, there's one example that, that uh, we have been showing this week here, we have some great uh, imagery for, and that is, here's a picture from the Landsat series of satellites uh, that shows the Columbia Glacier, which is located in southeast Alaska. Uh, this is the, the bluish, the light blue and cyan colors here are showing the glacier retreat. Over, uh, since 1986, the glacier has retreated more than 12 kilometers, or about nine miles. However, in this case, we don't think climate change has really uh, taken, melted, caused all the melting of the glacier. In fact, what happened was climate change gave this glacier an initial nudge, and then uh, natural processes kind of took over and, and caused the rest of the melting. Uh, it's kind of like if you're standing on the top of a hill and you give a ball a small kick, you know, gravity takes it the rest of the way. So in this case, climate change melted the glacier just a little bit, cause, putting it into an unstable regime, and then the pro other processes that we know about took it the rest of the way. Also, Dr. Holdren, uh, certainly the melting of the ice up in the Arctic is creating new challenges when it comes to shipping lanes, when it comes to impacts of, uh, on mammals in that area. Can you talk about international coordination and how, how that's beginning and going on? Sure. The uh, eight nations that uh, own territory in the Arctic formed, starting in 1996, the Arctic Council, the eight-nation Arctic Council, which has built up collaboration on such questions as navigation, marine fisheries, search and rescue, and also science. An important thrust of the Arctic Council uh, is improving scientific measurement and scientific cooperation in the Arctic. The United States happens to be in the chair of the Arctic Council, rotates in two-year terms. We happen to be in the chair now, and we're giving particular emphasis uh, to the science, as well as to the plight of indigenous people and how we can help them, and as well, of course, to safety, freedom of navigation uh, in the Arctic. We have in existence already an international Arctic system for observing the atmosphere, which is a collaboration of meteorological stations around the Arctic to help scientists conduct coordinated research and understand in a coherent way what's going on up there. The European Union has uh, an institution called INTERACT, which is the International Network for Terrestrial Research and Monitoring in the Arctic. Uh, it has a station in every Arctic country and every Arctic ecosystem type. So there's a lot going on to build up understanding of what's happening up there, but we need to do a lot more. Great. So we would like to give you all of you an opportunity to ask questions on this topic. Uh, so I know I'm not sure I preface saying that, so I'll give you a minute to think about it. And Dr. Holder, I'm going to put you on the spot. If you can just expand a little bit on coordinating across the federal government uh, with so many agencies and how really being in the chair of the Arctic Council and also your position in the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, what you're seeing in terms of how we're bringing everybody together. Well, thank you for that softball, Christy. Uh, uh, President Obama in January of this year created by executive order the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, which brings together the more than 20 cabinet departments and agencies that have activities and responsibilities in the Arctic. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, Amy Pope, who's the uh, assistant to the president uh, Deputy Assistant to the President for Homeland Security is the Vice Chair. The uh, committee is populated by the Deputy Secretaries of every Cabinet Department with interest in the Arctic, and that's most of them, as well as the heads of the various relevant agencies, NOAA, NASA, the National Science Foundation, the Coast Guard, and so on. And it has primarily four responsibilities. One responsibility is to synchronize priorities in the Arctic 
across all of those departments and agencies. A second is to coordinate and oversee implementation of those priorities in an organized way. The third priority is to improve communication between the U.S. federal government and the state government of Alaska and the indigenous uh, tribal leaders uh, across Alaska so that the federal government is speaking with one voice rather than with 24 or 25 voices about how we are working and should be working uh, with the state of Alaska and with those, uh, with those native communities. And the fourth function is to support the U.S. chairmanship of the eight nation Arctic Council in its international uh, activities to uh, bring a coherent approach to these challenges in the Arctic. Okay, Tom has the microphone, so please raise your hand if you have any questions. I will take a couple questions at once, get a whole range. I do want to say hello to some high school students in New Jersey who are watching us right now. And if you're online, remember you get your questions asked on Twitter using the hashtag AskUSCenter. So I'll take one, two, and three. How about we do the three in the front? Thank you. Your opening video featured black carbon as part of the problem. Uh, black carbon is not covered by the FCCC because it's a particulate matter, not a gas. The Arctic Council is rather weak as a regulatory agency. Uh, the International Maritime Organization is slow and the uh, CCAC is interested in black carbon in other areas. So it seems to be there's a gap in, in really acting on the black carbon problem. And I wonder if you have any ideas, any possibilities, any specific government uh, policies or plans to act on the Arctic black carbon problem. Yeah, we certainly have been working on that. The United States government uh, produced a report from the EPA not long ago on the challenges of black carbon. Uh, we are working on it uh, within the Eight Nation Arctic Council. One of the saving graces, perhaps, is that uh, soot, black carbon, is also a serious health hazard, a direct health impact in the, in the areas where it's being emitted. And as a consequence of that, there is a very substantial incentive for the nations involved to clean up their own black carbon emissions just on the grounds of public health. And we're trying to build on that to uh, get that problem under control. Okay. Thank you for the wonderful, wonderful show. I have a particular uh, climatological question. You, you told us that uh, the warming of the uh, uh, Arctic's, Arctic might uh, push down cooler air. And I wonder if uh, that's a good news because it might cool down lower latitudes. Could you elaborate on that, please? Well, it, it doesn't push down cool air consistently is, is the problem. What, what really seems to be happening is, as uh, was noted in the video and I noted briefly, the jet stream, because of the reduced temperature difference between the Arctic and the mid-latitudes, is getting weaker. The jet stream is driven by that temperature difference. When the Arctic warms faster than the mid-latitudes, the temperature difference shrinks, the jet stream weakens, it becomes wavier, and those waves in the jet stream allow lobes of cold air, particularly in the winter, to come south, and lobes of warm air from the south to go north. And so you have this almost paradoxical situation where the northeastern United States is unusually cold while Alaska is unusually warm. And uh, while there's still some controversy about exactly how these mechanisms work and how natural variability is interacting with the human influence, I think it's highly likely that we're going to see more of that. But again, it's not a consistent pattern where you're going to see the lower latitudes cooling in a way that offsets the warming associated with the greenhouse gases. I don't know, Patrick, if you want to amplify on that. So I'll say that changes in, in the temperature difference between the Arctic and regions farther south, we expect that to definitely have an influence on how the atmospheric air, how the circulation patterns will behave in the future. Uh, as Dr. Holdren referred to, you know, exactly what's going to happen, we don't know, but we do expect larger variability is likely due to the more meandering jet. Uh, the, uh, the 
the polar, the, the year of the polar vortex, 2013, 2014, uh, as Dr. Holdren referred to, some of those regions in the Arctic actually were very warm. Uh, the monthly average temperatures were in some regions were five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. So bringing it cold air down moves warm air into the Arctic, which you know, it accelerates the, it influences the climate change in the Arctic as well. So what we know for sure and the science is telling us is that you know, changing this equator to pole temperature gradient will will change the atmospheric circulation, but it's an area of active research to know exactly how that's going to uh, manifest itself in the, climate, in the climate system. All right, thanks for that. We'll take two questions here, one here in the front, I thought the point here in the back too, so. And there's a web question. You oh, mind if great. I add that? Go okay. for it. Great. Um, so let me give the web question first. Uh, Kristen at Lorax Lee asks, is the more dramatic change in Arctic Ocean acidity the result of colder water allowing greater absorption of CO2? It is, it is partly due to that, and it is partly due to the lower salinity, which actually enables acidification to proceed more rapidly. And the lower salinity is coming from the melting of the glaciers and the land ice in Greenland, which is adding fresh water, diluting the salt. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Luca Lombroso from uh, University of Modern and Reggio Emilia, Italy. Uh, one sh two short questions. One about uh, um, permafrost methane release and the risk of uh, big feedback. And one about uh, uh, if you have evidence about uh, impact of uh, jet stream change in Europe. For example, in Modena, in the northern Italy, uh, on February 2012, during a big uh, snowfall, uh, was colder uh, than uh, uh, Svalbard Island. Get that question? I'm, I'm not sure I understood uh, the second question, um, uh, which I, I think was asking us to elaborate on these patterns of cold yes, and warm. If you have uh, evidence of impact of uh, jet stream change, yeah, well, there's. In Europe, yes, there is there is evidence of that, okay. and uh, and a growing literature on on that phenomenon, and on on the feedback issues, the question I think of whether increased emissions of carbon dioxide and methane from the Arctic are going to have a big effect. Uh, one of the things that we know is that the amount of carbon stored in the soils of the far north is two to three times the amount of carbon that's now in the atmosphere, and the principal argument is how rapidly could that come out as the Arctic warms? Nobody knows the answer for sure, but certainly the potential is there for a significant acceleration of global warming, particularly if a lot of it comes out as methane, which of course is a much more potent greenhouse gas per molecule than carbon dioxide. I would say with respect to the, the permafrost, I would say that you know, in uh, 1997, the International Permafrost Association put together this, this nice map, a, a feat of real uh, tremendous feat of international collaboration in order to really map out the permafrost. And uh, recently, NASA actually digitized that map in order to uh, have a, a more usable, have it in a more usable, readable format in order to uh, move the, uh, move the, the uh, science forward. And recently, uh, the SMAP mission, the Soil Moisture Active Passive uh, mission that was just launched in January starting, it was able to, for the first time, map some of the freezing and thawing patterns that happened in the Arctic uh, over, over this past, uh, uh, the early spring in April. However, uh, the radar on that instrument did fail, so it's, it's much more difficult to, to map that going forward from this point. So I would say that there's definitely a need to have a very uh, robust data set of permafrost and the spatial variability of it going forward so that we can improve our understanding of how the permafrost is going to change in the future and so we can understand you know, how much uh, the carbon, uh, how much total carbon is in the permafrost and how rapidly we expect that to be released. All right, we have two questions here, one back in and one to the far back. Good afternoon, Reggie Jewell from Kotzebue, Alaska. It's good to see you. Hey, Reggie, good to see you. Um, a quick comment with regards to what happens in Alaska uh, doesn't stay there. The trampoline was derived from the blanket toss, and you know the history of kayaking in the Olympics as well as trampolining. So that, that's two examples. Uh, the question I have is with regards to some of the stuff that we saw, and you spoke about the melting ice and the opening of shipping lanes, how was the agency coordinating group taking a look 
at how the Arctic and people from the coastlines can, can develop some of the infrastructure to help be responsive in those areas as well as the infrastructure that may be needed in terms of um, other things that are beneficial to the country. All right, and hold on. Before answering that question, i get one more qu question back here. Hi, Quentin Zondervan from Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's my understanding that as the atmosphere warms up, it can hold more water vapor, and we know that water vapor is also a greenhouse gas. So do we understand how much that amplifies the warming and how, how much that will continue to amplify the warming going forward? Yeah, let, let, let me uh, take the second question first. Uh, yes, we understand that very well. The water vapor feedback is uh, a very important factor in determining the middle of the road estimate of the sensitivity of the surface temperature of the earth to changes in the greenhouse gas content of the atmosphere. The, the current estimate of that sensitivity, the best middle of the road estimate is about three degrees C per uh, doubling of CO2. And it turns out that more than half of that is actually due to the water vapor feedback. So that is well understood. To Reggie Jewell's question, and I should say that Reggie Jewell was a member of the uh, Council of State, Local, and Tribal Leaders helping the administration figure out how to respond to climate change. Reggie Jewell is the mayor of the North Arctic Borough in Alaska, which has an area the size of the state of Indiana with 30,000 people in it. And there are enormous challenges up there. And what is going on in the domain uh, that Mayor Jewell mentioned is an intensified interaction between federal authorities, Alaskan authorities, and the native uh, communities up there to figure out precisely how to build the kinds of in infrastructure and to add the kinds of capacities that will enable those communities to benefit from those changes that provide opportunities and to cope with those changes that are posing challenges. Uh, we think that similar activities are going on in the other Arctic nations, and that's one of the things we are talking about in the Arctic Council, trying to propagate best practices with respect to the interaction of national and provincial governments with the native, Amer the native communities up there so that we can benefit from the opportunities and cope with the liabilities. With respect to the water vapor feedback, uh, Dr. Holdren hit it right on the head. Uh, water vapor feedback uh, more than doubles the, the initial response due to just warming of CO2 alone. Uh, I wanted to highlight quickly some, some very uh, uh, innovative scientists at NASA Goddard Research Center are mapping uh, for the first time some of the changes in the Arctic moisture in particular. Because as we melt back the ice in the Arctic, you're uncovering more ocean. And we are finding signs of increase in the water vapor and in the moisture content of the Arctic atmosphere directly. All right, I believe Ashley has another question from online. From the web, yes. This is from Ms. B.D. Bondrake. Um, and so I, it's from the high school students in New Jersey that Tom introduced. And they ask, what can they do to get involved uh, with this Arctic issue? That is a wonderful question. Uh, I just met yesterday uh, at the U.S. Embassy downtown with a set of uh, teachers of uh, K through 12 uh, schools around the country who have been exceptionally effective in expanding their programs on climate education. We have, in the Obama administration, launched um, a year ago a climate education and literacy initiative, the premise of which is basically that the kids are the future. And our kids learning about climate change, how it's happening, what its effects are, what the potential remedies are, is immensely important to the future of this issue. So I would say to kids in schools, including uh, the, the young folks who asked that question, uh, the first thing that, that kids can do is learn about this problem. The second thing they can do is persuade their parents, since, since political will is going to be important to establishing and maintaining the policies we need from our governments. But I can see that Christy is uh, ready to add something on this. <laughs> uh, yes, so high schoolers in New Jersey, I think very much now what we're seeing coming out of this 
conference. We're talking to mayors, talking to governors. It's getting engaged in sharing your own passion on this issue. So if you are concerned about the Arctic, I mean, there has been a long history in the United States of communities who have talked about the wonderful wildlife there, the ecosystems, the importance of this special place. Uh, to the entire United States. And I, I really think we have a responsibility, whether you're in high school at or, or at other points, to share that story, to blog about it, to share pictures uh, of the president's trip or other pictures that you find online about this amazing location. Because it can feel far away. It can feel disconnected if you're in the lower 48 states of the United States. Uh, but really, what exists in the Arctic, if, whether you're talking about the caribou or any of the other amazing wildlife there, is truly unique and it is an incredibly special location. So we need your help and everybody else's help to talk about that place and really share it with your friends and your family online and elsewhere so that people feel more connected to what's happening up there so we can have the political will to respond and protect the location for future generations. What I would say is that uh, I love working at NASA and I love being a scientist. So I would encourage all those kids, you know, learn about science. If you're really interested in it, go after it, major in a college, because w we need more people in the world that understand science, and, because I, I think it really helps society. So I really like what I do, so I encourage you to do it too. <laughs> all right, we have a couple of minutes left, so I can take a couple more questions. I see one here and one in the back. Hi, Robert Gibson, Hong Kong. Uh, the potential lit release of permafrost or methane from permafrost in the Arctic could be enormous, enormous impact. What can be done to stabilize it aside from get, you know, stopping the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? All right, and one more question back here. Uh, well, let, let, you want to take the question before yeah, we'll take I do the, the question answer? And then okay. answer both. Uh, hi, uh, I'm from the Sami Parliament of Norway, and uh, together with me, I have two people here. Uh, who is also Sami people, they are representing the Sami Council, who is one of uh, the six uh, permanent participants in the Arctic Council of our indigenous peoples. And I have a question, how are you going to uh, uh, communicate with the indigenous people, of the native people of uh, Alaska when you develop new policy and stuff like that? In Norway, uh, we have a system, a consultation agreement between the Sami parliament and state authorities. And that works very well, and they are obligated to consultate with uh, both the Sami parliament and the direct group of Sami people who are effective of any new policy uh, legislation or other things. Thank you. Okay, very, very quickly on, on the first question. The single most important thing we can do to slow the problems arising from the thawing of permafrost is to slow our emissions worldwide to reduce the rate of temperature increase. It's very hard to intervene directly in any other way. And that's why the discussions at this COP21 conference are so important. We really need the world to move together in concert to reduce those emissions, to reduce the driver. As to the question on the uh, mechanisms for interaction with the indigenous peoples across the Arctic, Again, we started to do that in the United States with the Council of State, Local, and Tribal Leaders that advised the U.S. government on what we need to do uh, with respect to climate change, including in the Arctic and including in interaction with indigenous people. When President Obama went to Alaska for the Glacier Conference, there was a roundtable, I think Christie also participated in it, with uh, Native American leaders uh, from across the U.S. Arctic. That has led to a set of follow-up activities and to the uh, expansion of our activities in the Arctic Executive Steering Committee aimed at improving the communication between the federal government and those communities. But again, it is also a theme of our chairmanship, the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council, to share best practices across countries in terms of working with the indigenous people to address the, the particular challenges that they face. One of the other announcements, just to add on to what Dr. Holdren just said, when the president was in Alaska, he announced we have a commission called the Denali Commission in Alaska that uh, had a particular mission when it was first established. We're going to rework the 
mission of the Denali Commission and a key component of that will be working with the Alaska Native community. I mean, consultation in the United States, we are working on that constantly. <laughs> consultation, consultation, consultation is what uh, Secretary of the Interior Sally Jewell would tell you. Uh, it is far from perfect in the position we have uh, with many of the uh, tribes in the lower 48. Alaska is a slightly different um, uh, situation than we have with some of the other tribes. So we are hoping that working through the Denali Commission and with partners like Mayor Jewell and others that we can improve upon what's been started. But it is an ongoing question and I think something that we really do have to improve upon if we're going to get this right in terms of addressing what the communities need in the Arctic. Well, uh, NASA doesn't specifically deal with communicating with indigenous people, but I, I'd like to just quickly note that uh, NASA's just kicked off uh, an eight to 10 year field campaign called the Arctic Boreal uh, Vulnerability Experiment. Uh, and we're trying to understand exactly how environmental change in the Arctic is influencing both the ecosystems as well as how, uh, the, the, how that influences the human systems and particularly how the human system can use those uh, Arctic, uh, the ec ecosystem services. And as part of that, there is some outreach component of that. So hopefully we can uh, connect with, with those folks who, who live in the region. All right, thank you. We're out of time, but I do want to thank Christy Goldfuss, Dr. John Holdren, and Dr. Patrick Taylor for a fascinating look at the Arctic. The round of applause.